The Amazon rainforest is one of the world's most important carbon sinks and one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. But as reams of scientific data show, it is being destroyed at an astonishing rate by miners, loggers, and ranchers who have flooded the territory in an effort to take what they can while there's money to be made. With so much of the rainforest lost, the Amazon is becoming hotter and drier, and as more of the forest is felled, it's approaching a tipping point, perhaps in the next 10 years, after which essentially it will become a South American savanna. The implications for the planet are profound. Huge amounts of carbon go back into the atmosphere, thousands of species die off, not to mention the untold numbers of indigenous people who depend on the Amazon for their home. If we lose the Amazon, we're screwed. It was with these stakes in mind that photographer, filmmaker, and artist Richard Moss went to the jungles of Brazil to see for himself exactly what was happening to one of the most valuable and ecologically sensitive areas of the world. Moss is known for his pioneering use of unconventional photography techniques, which I first came across in his 2012 series, Infra, which used Kodak Aerochrome, a film originally developed for military reconnaissance, to render the rebels in the Democratic Republic of Congo in otherworldly shades of lavender, crimson, and hot pink. It turns vegetation into something really surreal. And it's an amazing series for which he won numerous awards. And this set Moss in the direction of taking the surveillance and security functions of the camera and using them to reveal what is hidden. For his project on the Amazon called Broken Spectre, Moss uses infrared film, GIS mapping technologies, and ultraviolet cameras. And he does this to visualize the massive and sometimes invisible changes at the heart of this contested place. They're very much Wild West towns and very lawless and dangerous as a result. You know, they're, they're, if you rock up with a long lens and hope to steal a few photos like like people expect to do, you know, I don't think that's the right approach. And I think that would actually put you in, in danger. Filmed over the course of two years, following both the indigenous people who are trying to hold on to their way of life and the extractivists who are trying to carve out a living at the edge of the world. The result is a beautiful, immersive, multi-channel film on view at Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York until March 16th. I highly recommend, if you can, that you see it in person. I spoke with Richard from his studio in New York. Richard Moss, welcome to Non-Toxic. Thanks, Daniel. Hi. I'm really happy to have you on the show. I've been aware of the project Broken Spectre since it was showing in London, and then I was delighted to hear that it was going to be opening the new Jack Shaman space in, in New York. It's really interesting as an example of a way to kind of poetically and also quite intelligently examine a really complex conflict in one of the most important ecological places in the world. I wanted to start with just kind of a discussion of how you came to this subject. So the material in this show was filmed, if I'm not mistaken, from 2018 to 2020. That's correct, yeah. And that was the height of Brazil ex-president Jair Bolsonaro's efforts to basically ignore indigenous rights and environmental concerns and open up the Amazon to cattle ranchers and miners. And many indigenous and environmental advocates have been murdered there. And it's my understanding that it can be a pretty lawless place, especially when the government was looking the other way. Tell me about your decision to film in the Amazon during such a dangerous time. The genesis of the project is sort of twofold. One was very personal, but the, same, the other one was very almost theoretical, philosophical. On a, on a personal level, I, I was at, the, at the, the tail end of a very intense several years of production working on past projects, which, you know, involved constant travel, uh, not only for openings and, and, and artist talks, etc., and site visits, but, but more importantly for production, to, to get to the sites themselves where I would be filming, you know, primary testimonial evidential footage of, of, of history unfolding in the fields, often quite difficult scenes to witness. 
but important to document. So after several years of this, I really wanted to just take a break to to do something just for me. And so I'd always been interested in ultraviolet light and, and how, how we can't see this light that, that insects can see. So insects and flowers communicate in ultraviolet light, actually. And insects can see different bands of light that we can't. And so the flowers have evolved to to you know have form gra- graphic patterns on their petals explaining to to the bees you know where to go to to pollinate them and where the pollen is stored so there's a, a symbiotic evolution that's happened that's fascinating that we can't even see and that's amazing yeah it's beautiful that's amazing and and of course you know nature's like that there's, there's so much that we that we just take for granted that's just really extraordinary and i was also on a t- technical level always intrigued by ultraviolet light because it it cannot pass through glass i just wanted to go to go down to the cloud forest in ecuador and I found i found an eco lodge i also went to peru and start photographing at night with with ultraviolet lamps in the middle of the forest these wonderful orchids and other biomass and the orchid bees that come to them and, and i found that really restful and and wonderful and and and, and restorative and of course at the time you know then you start to you start to get bonded with the rainforest you start to love it and it it becomes a part of you on some level and and at the same time bolsonaro was elected and i understood the implications of that um and more more on a more sort of theoretical level at the same time you know i was struggling with with as a storyteller with trying to tell the story of climate change and global heating and these things that we face as a species it's such a massive abstract story that it's hard for any of us, let alone photographers, to to touch and to communicate adequately, which is really part of the problem we're facing, actually, I believe, in terms of uh, our failure to deal with this crisis, is, is that the stories aren't good enough. And I think as a storyteller, there's a moral imperative that we try harder. And so my, I suppose, I was looking for a way to, to break that down for myself. And I thought I'd better take a case study. And in this case, I, I chose something that's happening now, rather than something that unfolded during the Industrial Revolution hundreds of years ago. And and one of the most urgent stories happening right now is the dis- devastation, deforestation, and the disappearance of the Amazon rainforest, the lar- world's largest tropical rainforest, which began in earnest in, in the 1970s when the Brazilian military regime took power. And in 1970, there was an estimated 1% of the forest lost to, 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 to man's willful environmental um, extractive violence and today there's about 18 to 20 percent lost so you can see in the in in the, in the course of 50 years that's that's the course of human life that's within living memory we've lost 20 percent of the forest and so that you know we don't if we if we don't deal with this now and it's happening now we'll lose the entire forest quite soon and that's what the scientists are telling us too it's ep- exponential so the tipping point's upon us but because it's happening in real time now, that means we can do something about it now. It's not, it's, the story's not over. We have to, you know, we, we still have the, we still have the, the opportunity to, to stop what's happening there. And that, that was another reason I, I chose and dug into this subject. And of course, history itself presented, sadly, tragically, the opportunity be, simply because Bolsonaro was voted in. And, and, and in 2019, he, he just encouraged all the, all these farmers, big and small, all across the north of Brazil and the Amazon region to, to, to go hell for leather and, and deforest and, and, and fell logs and clear for, for pasture. It was a perfect storm, really, and I, I felt like I, I was well located to, to dive into this and I'd already got my sort of teeth into the subject. And so I began to gear up and raise funds and start to invite my erstwhile collaborators Trevor Tweeten cinematographer and Ben Frost col- um, composer down to join me in north of Brazil in the Amazon where we spent years researching the subject. You're known for making your work under sometimes difficult circumstances but I imagine this project and the length of time it took to complete was particularly trying. Was there ever a moment when you wanted to just give up or were afraid that you'd never finish it? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, there there was actually because the pandemic was made things just exponentially and no- awful, just on a log- logistics level. Everything became really impossible, like ten times more complicated than it should. And and you know, in the past, my projects were always 
sclerotic and, and, and chaotic and, and gargantuan in scale and ambition. And, but I think it's become increasingly so. And I, had, I, had, I was misguided when I assumed Brazil would be easier. Actually, it's up in the north of Brazil. It's the, the, the distances are vast. We're talking continental sized nation. And those roads are, are really not really roads. They're mud tracks and, and there's, there's rainy seasons and you can't get around. And oh, it's just it's really hard. And then, of course, the quarantining and the masks and the testing and the, what you can and can't photograph. And actually, in a way, that was a blessing as well, because a lot of photo people would have filmmakers would, would start with indigenous communities. It's the sort of obvious way to start making a film about this. And because they were off limits, because they they were shielding their communities in the forests, they hadn't received the, the vaccine yet. And, and so they were more vulnerable to respiratory diseases, genetically speaking. And so they were simply off, lip off the table in terms of reaching their communities, collaborating with them at this stage. But it was the same actually with politicians and, and officials in in you know, in the environmental police and nobody would talk to me because Bolsonaro would fire them. Anyone who's doing their job well was fired, including the head of INPE, the, the, the Brazilian National Space Agency, Ricardo Galvao. He released a report, did his job, showing using, you know, data harvested, harvested by satellites, showing how, how bad the situation was in the Amazon, how, how the deforestation had exponentially increased. So Bolsonaro just fired him. And that, that's indicative of how it's typical of, 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 of the culture there. It was a real crisis for the country. And so nobody would talk to me. So I, I literally went sort of grassroots and, and, just, and just drove up and down this bloody road, the Trans-Amazonian Highway, which was this access road built by the military in the 70s. And it links, you know, Atlantic from around Pará State, goes all the way to Acre via Rondonia, Amazonas, and it's a long, long road, and its intention was simply to develop economically, develop the the Amazon. So it's based on the neoliberal principle of, you know, big roads, arterial roads allow businesses to trade, allow economic growth, and they don't care at any cost. So you were driving up and down this road, and who did you meet, and how did that sort of kick off the process of finding the characters and, and the, the human stories that would become a part of this project. Right. So I had to find my subject and, and that's 99% of what I do is, is, is trying to find access. And I had a lot of doors slammed in my faces, as you can imagine, because these people are not stupid. You know, they're aware that they're carrying out illegal activities, environmental illegal activities, environmental crimes, effectively, that they could be punished for. So, a, you know, a, a gringo in a, in a, in a four by four, who who rocks up with a camera is not all is not usually welcome and i had to persevere to build relationships over time and that that requires a certain a certain understanding of of how you know interpersonal building trust especially with men as it happens because most of these activities are carried out by men and yeah so imagine illegal logging you know illegal mining and these are these are activities that are carried out in very remote regions where there hadn't been that many people and all of a sudden you introduce large numbers of young men who are who are coming to work for you know for profit obviously it's good money for them they don't have a lot of opportunities otherwise and so all of a sudden you have these 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 towns springing up which are all populated mainly by young men with money to burn and so that attracts all kinds of you know criminal elements such as uh, prostitution, brothels, cachaça bars and drugs. The, the, the narco cartels, you know, have infiltrated many of these towns. They're very much Wild West towns and very lawless and dangerous as a result. You know, they're, they're, if you rock up with a long lens and hope to steal a few photos like, like people expect to do, you know, I don't think that's the right approach. And I think that would actually put you in, in danger. And not only that, you just get bad pictures too a lot of the time. But but you're very remote and you're at the mercy of these communities. And if you upset them, you know, I, I don't think it's wise. So I learned to, to simply not take the camera out initially and to, and to go into the community, into the restaurants and the bars and to spend time with the men. And, and, and there's a, a very strong culture of machismo in Latin America, which is very distinct and it's a real... It's a real patriarchy. 
And I've learned over the years, and I've been working in, in, in similar kinds of cultures all over the world for 20 years now. And it's very interesting, in order to win the respect or the trust of, of, a, of a dangerous man in, in a position of power uh, who has some kind of um, macho uh, kind of um, status in the community, perhaps I've found that the easiest way to win them, to build that trusting relationship is to enter the room like you have absolutely no strength, like you're completely at, at his mercy, to show total deference and respect, but also to show your vulnerability. And that's something you do not, not only through words, but also through body language, and to show that you respect this man. And, and then, naturally, everyone's proud of what they've done in their lives, even if it's, you know, illegal. These guys work like dogs, and, and the guys who, who run these illegal gold mines, these garimpos, are very proud. They've spent decades in these pits in 45 degrees Celsius with 120 decibels all day long, six days a week, managing these teams of young men who work like dogs. It's hard work, it's super toxic, and they extract just little nuggets of gold. It's thankless, you know? And so... If you if you ask them about that, and they're generally very in, interested in, in telling you about about their lives, and I think that that's important to build that trust is, is to listen, of course. And everyone has a story, and over time, you know, you 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 do actually become friends with many of these people, and you you start to respect them as humans, and they don't have the opportunities we've had, and so the you know what they have achieved in life is quite is quite extraordinary, and. If you can get them, usually in, the best is to, in front of their workers. If you can simply disarm them in that way after some time and then and then just strike them with the question, oh, could, could we come tomorrow and film your activities in the, in the gold pit? And if you get them in front of the, their workers, they can't say no. It's just a, it's just a law. They, they can't, to say no would be to show weakness and they don't show weakness because they're strong, right? And so you've, You've totally disarmed them at this point, and they they say, "Of course, yes, of course," because they have nothing to hide. And yeah, so getting access was it required different different paths, different strategies for each for each subject. But I mean, that's a large part of what I do. Does this involve like a lot of drinking in little damp, dimly lit taverns? It does, yeah. <laughs> It does, yeah, and I really don't like shasa. It's evil stuff, but uh, it, I'm afraid I did have to uh, partake. And, of course, the gift of, of a bottle of cachaça, and they have all kinds of, you know, also eating with them. Brazilian people in that region, anyway, are the most welcoming people, and they'll bring you back into their homes where their wife has cooked this most incredible meal. And, and that's wonderful because then you get to see their real lives and, and you get to understand them as you are as a human with a family to feed and you start to understand the, the complexity of what they're dealing with and of the subject and rather than shake your finger at these people as environmental criminals are doing a terrible thing who must be stopped then you start to see well actually shit you know they got to bring the bread home and um, they have beautiful family and all of a sudden you you know you start to see the complexity and ambiguity of the entire story which is very important i feel as an artist to convey to the viewer because there's too much art now that's so so didactic and black and white and and you know it's that's not what art's for I believe I, I believe it's about embracing the that complexity and ambiguity and if you really dig into it and think about it you know in terms of agency it's us who who are responsible we're the consumers we have far more agency in in stopping all these crimes than they do they're merely carrying out the labor of extractive violence but we're the ones paying for it we're the ones funding it we're the ones consuming the final product and and so i think that's an important story an important lesson and and you have all the witnesses all their men in front of in front of you and so you, you say thanks and you show up at seven in the morning and everyone's collaborating and of course brazilians are extremely cultural people they love music they love films they love telenovelas when they see the big cameras come out the movie cameras they just love it so there's often a very performative element, um, which is not unusual for a lot of my films, my past films in, in Congo. Uh, there was a lot of performativity, a lot of collaboration with the rebels. They were performing for our camera and they scripted 
their their sort of simulated battles, for example. So it was familiar territory in that way. And as a result, we got access that very few others have. And, and, and then illegal loggers were similar kinds of animals. Very, very hardcore criminals who don't give a... They really don't care. Was this attitude of not caring about the environmental consequences shared by the women you met while recording this project? Yeah, so, you know, struggling, sort of dancing around the, the subject of masculinity and, and, and climate change. And, uh, and it's, an, it's an interesting pairing because they're slightly incommensurable ideas, but yet a very good way of unpacking some of the problems is, is to look at gender and all, all of that, the patriarchy in relation to extractive violence and what's happening in the world. I, I have to say your podcast is very interesting and surprising, actually. But if you look at the film Broken Spectre, the star of the film is a young woman, an indigenous woman named Adnea. And, and she was from the Yanomami community on the river Urari Koera. And, and she, her community were, were, were suffering nocturnal attacks from Garamperos, from illegal gold miners, with, armed with automatic weapons, tear gas canisters. And they were being terrorized. And some of them were being shot and killed. And, you know, she had to flee with her kids in the middle of the night because her, her hut was being strafed at random um, from the river from 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 these miners who were coming to exact revenge because they tried to blockade the river to stop them this is their land you know and they had no police no army came and their health care workers fled and they're extremely grateful that i made the journey when i heard about it and it was adnea who spoke most movingly because she had to pick up her own kids and, and run into the forest and not not that long ago like couple of days prior so the emotion is the rage is palpable and it's often the the women who become the real leaders of environmental movements because as i was saying earlier there's this kind of masculinization of these communities because of the influx of young men who come who come to earn lots of money and 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 that puts women in danger in these communities because it disrupts the sort of balance of the societies and Invariably, they bring disease and they bring sexual assault. They bring prostitution and rape. And, you know, it's it puts women in danger. And women have to go into the forest to carry out, you know, domestic duties. And they're most at risk, frankly. And so they are the ones who can speak most powerfully to this risk. And so I think that, that, that this, this these issues of patriarchy are central to the question, particularly in the Amazon, of extractive violence. And I think it's women who, who actually can stop it because, because they can speak to the, that experience more powerfully. More of my conversation with Richard Moss after the break. This episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Blue Corn Candles, a Colorado-based company that's been making handcrafted beeswax candles since 1991. Most candles in the market are made of paraffin, a diesel byproduct that's literally scraped from the bottom of the barrel. Blue corn candles are made from sustainably harvested and lightly filtered beeswax. The candles smell great, burn super slowly, and most importantly, they don't produce any toxic fumes. For the first time, Blue Corn has launched a new line of scented candles based on the rugged landscapes of Colorado. From the sagebrush covered foothills of Ridgeway to the pine forests of Telluride. During these dark months, Blue Corn is running a special deal for non-toxic listeners. Enter the code NONTOXIC, that's one word, all caps, at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Shipping within the U.S. and internationally. You're listening to NONTOXIC. I'm talking with artist and photographer Richard Moss about his new project, Broken Spectre, about deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. There are kind of three levels in this project. The stories that you were just telling me are kind of the middle level, the human scale. But this project is also looking at the situation of deforestation in Brazil on this macro, large scale environmental level. And then you're also looking at it on this micro level and combining all three with this like multi-screen installation and then still work as well. Can you talk a little bit about those different scales of visualization and why that was important to bring together in the in Broken Spectre? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in my practice over the last dozen years or so, I have kind of, you know, um, created a, a, an approach or um, a visual strategy for, for myself, um, which which I call aggravated media. Uh, and these are types, forms of photographic technologies, imaging technologies that, that carry some agency in the subject. So they are not just simply recording the subject, but they're embedded within the system of of the subject itself, they're the invisible systems that of of the conflict or of environmental ac- extractivism, for example. So, in, in the past, I used a special heat heat sensitive thermal imaging camera designed for for militaries and police forces to for for a number of purposes. But one of which was, you know, long range border enforcement and and insurgent detection, tracking, and targeting. So, it's part of a weapon system. And this, I used to to document refugees the, the the journeys of refugees across international borders and and seas into into the European Union and so it can foreground and encode more more abstract and invisible aspects of the story that we can't touch with the concrete medium of photography and so I wanted to take that lesson to to the Amazon too and I I dug into what well I was looking at what 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 type of Im- imaging technologies that scientists use and so I wanted to break it down onto scales that I could perceive. And and so I began thinking of it in terms of time and space and in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, we see within a, a very limited band of the electromagnetic spectrum and we hear within within it too. And so scientists can, can use, employ specific types of imaging technologies that, that can see outside what we can see. So, for example, the, the scientists who are observing the rainforest and analysing its its deforestation, the state and, and velocity of it, but also modeling the tipping points. Those people, they're analyzing data harvested by uh, multi-spectral cameras in, in remote sensing satellites in space. And they've been doing this for decades. And they, the technology they use is geographic information systems technology. So it's GIS. It's a kind of map making in a way. And it uses false color imagery, but it's combining different narrow bands of 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 light across the electromagnetic spectrum much wider than we can see and much more specific and and in doing so you can tell all kinds of things about the, about the, the health or degradation of of the environment and you can you can also identify certain species uh, it's very very powerful actually and it's used widely not only in by environmental scientists but also by multinational mining companies to pinpoint rare earth minerals as well as agribusiness interests, large farms that, you know, wanted to try to more profitably exploit their ranch farm land. So here's a very interesting medium on the crossroads between the good guys, the environmental scientists who are telling us how long we have left, and the bad guys, these big multinational interests who are trying to pinpoint rare earth minerals in the middle of indigenous territories to lay stakes, which they did in 2018 and 2019. When Bolsonaro came to power, these multinationals used multispectral imaging to, to, to pinpoint where they would like to dig. And then they applied for, for stakes to mine inside ancestral indigenous territories. This is highly illegal, you know. But Bolsonaro was promising that he would re- repeal these laws to allow them to mine. And thank God he was voted out because if he, if he wasn't, he, they would be now, right now, they would be going into indigenous territories and doing that. So that's exciting to me because the medium is somehow enmeshed in and guilty of 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 these human activities that are destroying the forest so technology is all, always has this, it's a double-edged sword you know it can save us but it can kill us and and that's the way i look at it i have a very ambivalent <laughs> approach to photography i i actually don't love photography i i, I have i have a kind of a, a sense of it as a predatory medium and and a cause of society's ills but also with the power to save us and and at the same time with the ultra spectra, ultraviolet light you know this is for scientists use ultraviolet microscopy to 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 reveal certain things about plants and flowers and 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 the biomass and so i wanted to do the same and you know remember that project i went to the cloud forest and i i went into the forest at night with ultraviolet lamps and the the biomass just just glowed like jewels like like you know, metallic foil and everything just lit up. It was really like being in a dream or you know, something I've never seen, the beauty of it. And, and actually the camera could only capture part of that beauty. It was the most wonderful thing. And of course, scientists use that to, to, to show us certain things about about the 
about the biomass. At the same time, I had the macro and the micro. So the macro is from the air with the multispectral camera. The micro is this, I'm looking carefully at the insects and moss and mold and, 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 and fungi and, and flowers and bees on a very small level. That's the micro. So I'm looking at literally four square inches on the forest floor in the middle of the night. It's a very strange pursuit, but but very interesting, very revealing. And and then I, I was looking for a third way scale, I suppose, to break the story down. And we need, it's hard for us as humans to relate to the non-human. And so, so the third medium, I chose black and white infrared film, motion picture, 35 mil, super 35. And this is, this is, the second time in the history of cinema anyone's ever done this. The first time was in, I think, 1962. There was a film called Soy Cuba, which is a Soviet film shot in Cuba about, you know, the colonization of Cuba by the Americans. And, and it's an incredible film, by the way. That's an interesting legacy. It's, it's quite, only certain scenes of the film were shot using this black and white infrared. It makes the skies go black and people's skin glows really white, as does the plants. They glow like, like they're ghosts or, or like they're on fire was used to great effect in Soy Cuba to show the violence of the sugar plantation. But I, I see a different meaning metaf- metaphor in it insofar as it, the chlorophyll in the, in the rainforest, which, by the way, the rainforest has so much chlorophyll, it's unreal. You can smell it. And the chlorophyll will reflect the infrared light, and that turns white on, on the film, on the black and white infrared film. And so it makes the plants look like they're glowing. And, and that's the thing that, that converts carbon in the atmosphere into biomass and stores carbon but when you burn it that's that releases carbon on mass and it's not just from the, the 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 wood in the forest but it's also from the soil and everything so i wanted to make a film that that also had some magic in the montage that 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 that, that sort of kind of wakes the viewer up in the leaps between the media so since wrapping up production of this project the situation has changed in brazil for the better. Bolsonaro lost the election to Lula, a leftist and longtime defender of the Amazon and indigenous sovereignty. And basically the destruction of one of the world's great carbon sinks has for the moment been averted. Are you breathing a sigh of relief? I was for a moment there for sure. You know, I had friends in Brazil who were threatening to kill themselves if Lula got it, which, you know, there was a lot, it was a country in a state of trauma you know he his his approach to the v- pandemic you know he killed half a million people because he was so high high on his anti-vax horse and he refused the Pfizer vaccine and, you know it it really was a, a big relief when he won and he won by the narrowest of margins far narrower than than President Biden here over Trump in the states it was really a close run thing and then of course the 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 storming of oh, the Congress that happened in Brasilia was just extraordinary and I wish I was still making the film because I was meant to be there that day but we'd, we'd had to draw a line under production which is always the way where do you end you know you could keep going forever but uh, yeah no uh, I have a friend John Lee Anderson who's a veteran Latin American political journalist and and one of the more respected journalists there is he writes for New Yorker mainly and he he he's been a big ally and almost a kind of mentor to me over the years and Anyway, he was excited to hear we were working in the Amazon because it's close to his heart. And uh, so he's been trying to get the New Yorker to write, to send him down. And they finally sent him only a couple of weeks ago, a month ago or so. And he went up to, to many of these communities, the Anomami Territory, where I visited. And, because the, what happened is Lula came to power and, and immediately sent the army in to Yanomami Territory to, to try to remove the illegal gold miners or Garimperos, these, these very dangerous communities from from the indigenous territory and so that happened but but then john lee went in to, to see what the results were and he said it's a it's a it's a joke you know it's really all for international press that nothing's really changing it's you know it's they're just parking units in the in certain towns indigenous towns and forgetting about you know there there isn't a whole lot happening and the only time anything happens is for the camera so he he was particularly depressed about about progress and i and, and i'm afraid you know i'm getting fiona watson from survival international who's a big fan of the film and a friend of the film you know she's sending me the most disturbing texts on whatsapp just the last few days with you know the Yanomami, you know so skinny and the, the rainforest is a very rich place in terms of 
food. These people are so starved out by by what's happening, by the violence and disease is such a major factor. And these are small communities. They're, you know, they they don't have, you know, they don't. Once they're gone, they're gone. And 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 uh, yeah. So no, I'm afraid I I'm afraid it's just as bad as ever. And and speaking to many activists in in the Amazon, you know, because I try to when you meet them and you meet them in different places, they're all over. And so it's a great opportunity to say, well, what do you think needs to be said? And often just the consensus is that it's just a matter of time. You know, if, if Lula gets in, it just slows it down. But really, in the current globalized economy, just the Amazon's doomed. And I, they don't see a way to stop it. Ten years is all we've got. And have we seen much changes to the way we consume? You know, these big corporations like JBS, multinationals, that they're, you know, they're completely... in destroying the, the rainforest and selling out all these goods to big american corporations like or multinationals such as burger king or, or uh, you know the the hides not just the meat 80 percent of the deforestation comes from cattle farming and, and uh, it's not just beef that's 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 the that's the commodity but it's also the leather uh, and we wear that and we sit on it in our fancy cars and it's everywhere you know this stuff is you know it's the soybeans that they you they grow there there's nothing else they they harvest three times a year and nothing else can grow it's total monoculture like it's just as far as the eye can see there's not a hedgerow it's like iowa yeah and that's the thing that we try to convey in in the film is this repetition of history that which is why the film we made is the western because the western you know is a kind of nostalgic glimpse at, at a not so recent past or fairly recent past actually 150 years ago in the united states all the same things happened ecocide the the, the sense of manifest destiny that that the, the colonizers could come in and could could master the the do, dominion of the of the natural world and in the, to do so they were entitled to to round up and kill indigenous communities uh, and and completely just devastate the 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 wilderness and turned it into ranch land it's very similar and that's the real incongruous crazy thing that going down the trans amazonian highway you will see you know cowboys with the big 10 gallon hats and the, and the belt buckles and the big spurs and riding on horseback rounding up cattle it's a real living culture there and and it's quite distinct from gaucho culture in argentina and vaquero culture in the northeast these are these are different types of cowboy cultures. The Amazonian cowboy culture is, is very closer to what they call Texano culture, which, mm. of course, is, you know, it's all about rodeos and, and line dancing. And, and you can hear it in the country music. You know, this is this is very much influenced by a North American cowboy culture. And, and that really threw me for a loop because I really didn't see it coming, actually. And so we were trying to make that more explicit in the film by referencing the music of Ennio Morricone, which we hope creates a kind of window of association for the viewer, for particularly for a, for a Western viewer who's familiar with you know spaghetti westerns and and, and that music, and and just to, to 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 kind of create the link between what happened 150 years ago in the U.S. and perhaps longer, 400 years ago in Europe, it's happening now again in all the same ways in Brazil. When artists make work that's socially engaged the way you've been working, I think, for a long time. They're often asked to justify aestheticizing pain or oppression or violence. How do you think about that conundrum? Earlier you said, you know, photography is a predatory medium and and you sort of go back and forth on whether it's a tool for good or evil. Do you have an answer to that quandary when people put it to you or, or do you just kind of shrug and, and keep making the work because that's what you do? I believe beauty is the sharpest tool in the box when it comes to communicating and, and you know we as artists we can't really do much we can't affect the world beyond making these images and and what we do is to aestheticize that that's just an inherent part of what we do and you might as well amplify that and and really communicate to people through through the power of aesthetics and I don't mean just beauty I mean also the sublime I mean you know spectacle I mean scale I mean affect all of these are arrows in the quiver that we can shoot the viewer through the heart with and make them feel something because we can't do anything else 
And what they do with that feeling is up to them. But, you know, a sea artist is one small part of of society, of, of a much bigger machine that can affect change. And, you know, it's the people who watch the art who who go home and perhaps change how they consume or or who are volunteers or they're human rights lawyers or they're people like you, podcasters, who can spread the word better and um, more clearly and to break it down for people. And so altogether, we you know we multiply each other's efforts but mine simply all i can do is is to make pictures and that is ultimately just a form of aestheticizing so i don't see why you wouldn't lean into that and embrace your symptom as zizek said and and just go hell for leather and and if you do that in a way that's unsettling to them that's interesting because it stays with them you know and if if they're seduced by the image and then they realize oh my god i'm involved in this crime and, and it's the world you know it's destroying the natural world and and that that's that's a tension that that will create a dilemma in the viewer's mind that that's good you've started to activate the viewer and yeah okay some people might not like the work you might not get five stars but because they're upset but that's not the point the point is to make people feel something go home and think about it and and hopefully people re- will remember the work in the years to come because there's so much forgettable detritus in our culture it's very hard to, you know, to, to get through to people about these important, urgent stories. And one, one of the, my strategies is also to sort of lean into the, the, the chimerical, the, the dreamlike quality of, of the narratives, to decontextualize them in a way so that they don't become too prosaic and, and too didactic. And, you know, because people fall asleep when they hear about, you know, too much of that stuff. You want to really give them a memory of something something out of their dreams something you know visceral and 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 and, and i think that that's something we do in the, in, the, in these videos strange video immersive videos that we make there's they're very specific strange videos that but they do seem to speak to people and oddly this one's very long 74 minutes takes some time but people do spend time with it they they, they watch they tend to watch the whole thing which is quite extraordinary a lot of people don't spend time with video art yeah, it's just something you pass through on the way to the mirrored selfie room. Don't get me going about the or the Van Gogh immersive video. Oh, God mm-hmm. almighty. I hope I think the most important thing that were the best thing I could do as an artist is to is to is to invite you to participate and for you to feel your agency and to understand and, and, and to, to try to draw meaning from the piece and, and, and by extension to practice that in your life. Well, Richard Moss, thank you so much for coming on Non-Toxic. It was a pleasure to get to talk with you about your new show, Broken Spectre, which is on view at Jack Shaman until March 16th. Thank you again for coming on Non-Toxic. And yeah, anyone in New York, go see the show. Thanks, Daniel. Before turning my hand to climate, I got my start as a reporter, really more as a critic, especially of art and culture. And so I often come back to this question of what exactly an artist or any kind of creative person can do when faced with some, when faced with a crisis as large as the climate. Richard, I think, provides one of many examples to follow in that he's just so committed to making the very best work he can that's not didactic, that doesn't just beat you over the head with how bad things are or might be, but offers a more complex and ambiguous, but at the same time, much more moving picture of the beauty and tragedy of the destruction of a place like the Amazon. I'm also really impressed by the level of compassion he has for his subjects, not just the victims and the people who suffer as a result of the deforestation, but the everyday people, the miners, the loggers who are caught up in a system of extraction from which they hardly benefit at all. And I think he's right to put the real onus on 
the people who have the money, the people in the West, and more specifically, the companies like JBS or companies that buy the beef from companies like JBS, places like Burger King and Cargill, who ultimately sell you that patty that you have on your plate for the Super Bowl. It's a complex and mostly invisible chain, but it's one that I think we need to be attuned to because these are the forces, so often invisible, that hold the fate of the Amazon. And it's up to us to decide whether a place like the Amazon continues to exist or vanishes from the face of the earth. As always, Non-Toxic is hosted by me, Daniel Penny. The show is produced by Loose Thread Studios with help from Andrew Lewis. Our music is by Nathan Sharp, and our artwork is by Sam Creasy. If you want to support Non-Toxic, you can go to patreon.com slash non-toxic podcast and sign up today. We've got three different levels of membership, and we could really use your support to keep this show going. Help us detoxify the discourse. Sign up today.